Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, session on following the science by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Very much, we hope, a discussion session in which you will be able to contribute, ask questions, uh, and get responses. However, we have a very distinguished panel who will be answering your questions, but also will be starting off by making a number of comments on our topic, which, as I say, is about the role of data and evidence during the pandemic. And indeed, I think one of the remarkable things of the past year is how much science and scientific data and scientific evidence has become part of our lives. It certainly probably had more impact on government policy making than ever before. It's been in the media more than ever before. And I think it's become part of everyday conversations. We all now talk about uh, Vox and VUIs. We discuss vaccinology and epidemiology. We discuss behavioral science as well. We talk about adherence. We wonder what the impact of passports will be on behavior and so on. So science has become very much part of popular discourse. It's become part of our lives. It's shaped policies. And therefore, it's all the more important for us together to discuss, have we gone about things the right way? What do we learn? How can we do things better next time? So let me first start by introducing you to the panel. The first person, this is in alphabetical order, so it's not an order of precedence of any sort, although each person could be argued to have reasons for precedence. The first is Linda Bald, who's Professor of uh, Public Health at the University of Edinburgh. Linda has become a public figure over the last year, I think, and, and writes a column for the Glasgow Herald. So whether you like it or not, you're going to be hearing a lot more from Linda over time to come. The second person is Roland Cow, who's a Chair of Veterinary Epidemiology and Data Science at the University of Edinburgh. I noticed that a year ago, Roland wrote a piece for The Guardian arguing that we should be taking issues of mass gatherings and improving the testing system very seriously. I think you could probably republish that, Roland, without changing it very much right now. A very prescient piece and a very important set of issues as well. The third person is Kenneth MacDonald, who again, many of you will know because Kenneth for many years has been on our television screens in our radio. I, I did notice on the website of Newsnight Scotland, he it says he escaped academe with a law degree. Well, I'm sorry, Ken, but we've claimed you back. So you didn't escape for that long. You can never get away from the clutches of academe. And finally, Eileen Stewart, who's Deputy Director of Nature and Climate Change at Nature Scotland. I did, in, in, in looking at the background, look at your Twitter feed, Eileen. And I have to say, it, it seems to me you're also probably a, a professional photographer because the Twitter feed is looking worth looking at, not only for the information, but for some wonderful images of, of nature in Scotland and, and what could be more beautiful than nature in Scotland. Okay, so that's our panel. And I'm going to start off by asking a general question to each of the panelists and follow it up when they've all responded with a specific question to each. Uh, I think that will probably take about 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll open things to general questions. So Linda, let me start off with a question to you and, and, and a general dilemma that we have in communicating science, which is the balance between inspiring trust and acknowledging uncertainty. But actually, <laughs> I'm a very amateur presenter, I should say. That's my specific question to you. But I'm going to ask you and everybody else to start off by answering the, the general question. And the general question is very simple indeed. What have we learned about the relationship between data, evidence, public understanding and policy? And what should we do better? I was going to say next time. Hopefully there won't be a next time in terms of pandemics, but there certainly will be next times in terms of issues like climate change and so on. So what have we learned? What can we do better? And we'll start with Linda. Thanks very much, Steve. Well, I think there is a lot that we've learned. And I think, as you said, rightly in your opening remarks, this year has really brought science to the fore and allowed researchers and many others to contribute in the public realm in a way that we perhaps have not before. And I think we can continue that as we tackle new challenges. I guess the first thing is to recognize that a complex issue like a pandemic is an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary enterprise. There are multiple disciplines that have something to contribute. You don't need to be an epidemiologist or a virologist but clearly they're hugely important. So I think the first thing we've learned and the media, I think is, is has become very good at, although they've always done that, 
is to consult experts from a range of perspectives. And for the experts, including myself, I think it's also about learning not to uh, step too far out of your lane and recognize where you have disciplinary expertise to contribute and to promote and um, advise on others who can be asked, particularly from my perspective, other female scientists, early career colleagues and people from a diverse range of backgrounds. And I've tried to do that throughout. Just a couple of other opening points on that. Another thing I've really remembered when you're dealing with a topic like this is we're talking about human life. And when we talk about statistics and data, these are people. These are people that have lost their lives. These are communities that have been affected. And I think humility is a really important tool that we all need to use in our communication. Um, and then I think the other thing I would just say, and thank the Royal Society of Edinburgh and others for this, is to try when we communicate in the UK media to recognize that we have colleagues from around the world who are facing common challenges and try and bring an international perspective to how we communicate. So those are some of the things I think I've learned. Do you want me to move on to the specific question for me? Or no, we'll, I'll around? go around everybody for Lovely. the general and then come back to the specific. Um, so next, Roland. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Stephen. And, you know, a lot of the things that uh, Linda is saying, I absolutely agree with. So I'm not going to go over the same territory, but just try to add a few other perspectives. So, so I, I do models and data science. And one of the big things is that there has been an enormous interest in the role of data in advising policy, but also in public forums in a way that I haven't seen before. You know, wealths of data, which we all knew were out there, which we knew that companies like Google, for example, collect national data, all sorts of things, and clarity in terms of understanding the scientific issues, both to policymakers and to the public, involves taking some really complex intersections of data and trying to present them truthfully. Okay, that complexity can be used in a lot of different ways. And it's very easy to lose the messages by presenting them in an unclear way. There, there are general issues here, I think, about trying to do something which is, as I say, both truthful, okay, but also tells, tells the message in a way. And this goes back to the balance of providing evidence and providing opinion. So I, th I think that's really all I'd say in addition to them is, again, that diversity of disciplines, I think is absolutely critical. It's not all just about one thing. And one of the things those data issues bring up is how important data science is, but data science is always in the context of so many other different things. Thank you very much. And Ken? I think the thing that, that my, as the American say, my, my takeaway from, from this would, would be that there's no such thing as the science, as in when politicians say, we're following the science. The science is, it is not the same as science. The, the, the science is, depends on the advice they choose to follow and the people they have chosen to advise them. And that, that is why we saw the rise of groups like Independent Sage, for example, who questioned many of the approaches that the government was using when it was following the science. The other thing was that, that this is not simply a question, as Roland pointed out, of, of hard numbers. These are people. And that was one of the things that I always made, tried to make a point of when I popped up in Good Morning Scotland, first thing before most people were up, to point out that this may sound like the world's worst cricket scores, but actually these are all individuals. Um, and that, that was a hugely important point to get across because it, it actually leads to the, the other thing I learned, which was that this is not simply a question of the hard numbers because it involves human behavior and the science of human behavior. And that feeds into policy as well. And it, it fed into the way that governments around the world responded to that and the way that people responded to what the governments wanted them to do. Mm. Thanks very much for that, Ken. And, and as, a, as, as a psychologist, a behavioural scientist, I, I'm very pleased to hear you say that. I think one of the things we have learned is how it is important to include the range of sciences. And I mean, I used to say that until we get a vaccine, then behavioural response will be the most important ones. What we've learned is now we have the vaccine, the behavioural is as important as ever before in terms of people getting vaccinated, but also in terms of how people behave once vaccinated. So again, it's not that one science is more important than any other. It is that intersection that everybody's talked about so far. And now, Eileen. Yeah, 
Thank you, Steve. So I'm a scientist and ecologist and I've worked a, in the nature, nature Scott and government's nature agency for sort of 30 years. So science and evidence is absolutely core to what we do and, and communicating how important nature is and, and the changes that are going on in response to climate change and biodiversity loss is, is critical to what we do. So I think some of the lessons I've learned have, have kind of reinforced things that we've understood for a while. And, and I think the public aren't inherently interested in science. They're really interested in stories. And, and the trick for us is to communicate science in a way that answers the question, what does it mean for me? Because ultimately that's what people are interested in. They're not interested in the dry academia and the results, which we tend to get rather fired up about, but it's it's actually, you know, what does this mean in practice? How is this going to affect my life? And I think we've really learned that that's been critical to getting the kind of behavior changes and the acceptance of, of you know, the changes that need to be made over, over the recent pandemic. In terms of what we need to do differently on what we, we should learn from this, I think one of the things that has been a big challenge has been communicating about uncertainty. I think, you know, this has been a sort of under, underlying theme. And I think there's a there's a classic quote that says, you know, it's far better an approximate answer to the right question, even when that's vague, than an than a exact answer to the wrong question, which you can always make, you can always make accurate. So I think, you know, we've got to get better at that sort of translation of uncertainty and confidence that uncertainty isn't a problem because we can adapt and we can put in adaptive responses and we can learn and respond. And I think as the pandemics kind of continued, we've got much better at doing that by establishing pathways and for people to understand that, you know, we are putting in measures, but we will learn from them and respond. So I think that's one of the take home messages for me that we have to get that wider understanding that uncertainty isn't inherently a problem as long as we recognize and respond to that appropriately. So, so thank you very much for that. Yeah. And I think two key points there. I mean, I think one of the things that this country has been bedeviled by has been, you know, that old notion of two cultures of, of, of science and arts. And often scientists uh, like to distinguish themselves from the arts by not being storytellers, or at least by being very bad storytellers. And I always say to my students, yes, of course, we're storytellers. And we've got to get people interested in our story. We are telling stories with the evidence, of course. We're not making it up, but we are storytellers. And becoming better storytellers, I think, is absolutely critical. And embracing that as one of the things we do, I think, is equally important. The other point you made about uncertainty then takes me on to my specific questions. But before I ask specific, specific questions to the panel, can I just remind everybody who is listening that we're also interested in your questions and the way to ask your questions is using the Q function, which hopefully you will find at the bottom of your screens. Okay, good. And immediately I see a question has arisen, so it works. That's nice to know. So let me go on to the specific questions. And I've already asked my specific question to Linda, but I'll repeat it and it takes off very much from what Eileen is saying, which is this issue of uncertainty, of acknowledging and communicating uncertainty, while at the same time being clear that, that science, while not absolutely certain, can still, still give us valuable insights and it, that it is worth following the science. So Linda, how do you see this balance between communicating uncertainty, but maintaining trust and hopefully some measure of influence? So I think I, Eileen's made some very good points and I agree with all of them. Steve, I, I think for me, one of the things I've learned over the last year is just the importance for me of preparation, a huge amount of preparation actually, to get over this topic and understand what the papers and studies are telling us, what the data is telling us. And then within that, use the skills that most researchers have of critical appraisal to be critical of the evidence. So as, as Roland's saying, um, you know, statistics can be used in so many different ways. And, and we can look at a study or the data and say, well, this is pointing in this direction, but we're not 100% confident. And that's difficult because people like facts, they like certainty, but there's been so much that's been uncertain. And let me give you briefly some specific examples. Face coverings asymptomatic transmission, whether the virus is airborne, you know, what we should do in different settings like schools, whether children, what role do they play in the pandemic or not? And then how do we talk about the modeling, which is fraught with problems, but so valuable in so many different ways. So I think it is just about trying to be honest, conveying what you know, 
trying to talk about kind of relative and absolute risks as well, which, for example, has been relevant recently in relation to the adverse, the, the blood clots and the low platelet cancer associated with now, we think, two vaccines from what the medicines regulators have been looking at. So those are important things. And the final thing, I think, for researchers communicating in the media, it's also to be able to say that they don't know. They either don't know the answer to a question or we don't know the answer to that scientific question yet. So those are some of the techniques I've used, but I've listened to many others do that far, far more expertly than I, and I think we need to convey that to our students and others. Thanks. I think the courage of being able to say, I don't know, is really important. It is a difficult thing to do, but uh, as you say, it's critical. It does take courage. Roland, you've already touched on this point, but I uh, wonder if you want to elaborate on it, which is, if you like, the, this the line between presenting the evidence, presenting the science, and advocating for policy, and whether you think that's different in different areas. So, for instance, as a social scientist, one of the things I've always researched is intergroup relations and racism. I don't just um, present the evidence about racism. I think of myself as an anti-racist and uh, want to argue for anti-racist policies. Is that different in different areas? Can we make a distinction between presenting the evidence and advocating on the basis of that evidence? Uh, the, the lines are never clear, are they? We're, we're, we're not just scientists, we're not just academics, we're members of society and we're people with opinions. And a little bit to follow on from the, the point about, you know, being able to admit you don't know is also being able to admit when you're wrong. <laughs> you know, it, we, we need to be able to do both. And I think that's important in this context in the sense that, you know, when we are acting as advocates, one of the problems of extremely bright people is that they're very good for finding reasons why they are right. You know, no matter what the evidence is, there's always a bit of wiggle room. And so it's one of the reasons why I think that while it's, a, it's perfectly okay to be an advocate, it is not okay to be a, a stealth advocate. If you have prejudices as an individual, either because of your scientific research or otherwise, it's really important that we declare that that's what we're doing. We need to do that to policymakers. We need to do that to the general public. You know, I'm really in favor of what, there was an American academic by the name of uh, Roger Pielka who wrote a book called The Honest Broker. And the idea was that there are different roles that scientists can play, everything from being essentially a pure scientist, somebody who really just does the science and throws out the evidence out there. Very difficult to do nowadays, now that people are so interested in something like COVID-19, to somebody who not just, not acts as an advocate for positions, but acts as a, a filter and as somebody who, who gives options to policymakers and lets the public understand what those options are. Now, as I said, I, I think there's nothing wrong with acting as an advocate. You know, we, we have our own sets of moral imperatives as well as our scientific ones, but we need to separate them out depending on the role that we're taking and be clear about what we're doing. Thanks very much for such a thorough answer uh, to such a complicated question. I'm going to come on to Ken and ask you a question about how uh, the nature of the media and of media values relate to uh, scientific values and scientific priorities. Because one of the things personally that I've talked about quite a lot is how uh, the media on the whole seem to prefer you know, a crisis or a, uh, a calamity, that a house party with 100 people uh, is far more interesting than, to them than 10 million people sitting quietly at home, with the result that we overestimate the, the degree of non-compliance, and perhaps even set a norm that undermines compliance. So uh, that's a specific issue, but more generally, uh, to what extent does a media appetite uh, for crisis and controversy, if it bleeds, it leads, impact and perhaps even distort coverage? You've got to get people to read or watch. Of course, you've got to make it exciting. But a lot of the time, you know, the, the, the realities are, are mundane, even if those mundane realities are important. So uh, how does one deal with that tension? It, and it how is, does it dealt with it well? Yeah, some, some people think it's... It, it's a problem. I just think it's a reality that news desks, and that's whether it's radio, television, online, the web, whatever. 
they are interested in the three C's, contrast, conflict, and controversy. That That is what sells a story. Um, if people sit quietly at home, I'm afraid that's not news, un unfortunately. It's, it's, it's man bites dog is, is, is the news story. That, that is, and I think in this case, you, you, you can certainly le level that up. every news desk that has covered this this story. And it, it, you can le level it at me because uh, I, was my coverage alarmist? I think it probably was. Was it unnecessarily alarmist? I don't think so. If you look at the, the, the numbers, I hope that the sorts of things I was, I hope I'm conveying reality. I hope... I hope I managed to convey the grimness of this reality and, and the way in which it was, first of all, sweeping the world towards us. And then simply by looking at, unfortunately, the hard numbers, the, the cricket scores, as I called them earlier on, looking at how much worse the United Kingdom was, was faring in its response to the virus than, than to many, many other developed countries around the world. And that that was... I, 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 it's important to get it across. I mean, that there were, for example, I, I was looking at the House of Commons Library, who are great at coming up with these things, um, to see how many civilian casualties there have been in the United Kingdom in the Second World War in, in six years. And it was less than half hmm. the number of people who've died of coronavirus in just over a year. That's the reality. And if, if that's stuffed full of, of the three Cs, that, I'm, I'm afraid, I, I think is... I think it's quite good. The other thing I wanted to, to just mention is, is something that, that, that several of you have raised, that it was the first time in, in covering science that I was reporting about scientific papers that hadn't been peer-reviewed. And I'm having to point out, hang on a minute, this is a preprint. Pre it's massively important or potentially massively important that people know this, but you always have to couch it in, in those terms that, hang on, I know all science is provisional, but the science we're giving you just now is even more provisional than we would normally tell you about. Mm -hmm. I think that raises a really interesting question about how the things we need to do to produce evidence in a timely fashion to feed into policy when things are changing so quickly, how does that square with, with scientific practices of various sorts? As you say, I think the, the, the vast growth of rapid reviews, uh, the vast growth of preprint services and so on raise really fundamental questions for, for science as well. So I think that's a really interesting question we might want to explore further. But I'm gonna to come to Eileen and ask you, if we have learned things from this, the, this pandemic about the relationship between science and policymakers, between science and the media, science and, and the public, uh, how do we ensure that we make sure that those lessons aren't forgotten and that they endure when the pandemic is finished? Yes, thank you. The problem with following Ken is I'm trying to think of something controversial to say so that <laughs> <laughs> it's newsworthy but I, but I won't go down that route I mean there's a, there's an awful lot that we can learn and we should build into the way we work but I think that the thing that I'm going to touch on and I think perhaps the thing that has been most profound is this multidisciplinary approach and, and I think that's not just about how science and scientists collaborate but it's about how policymakers develop policy as well and I think if we could build in that sort of multidisciplinary by default approach going forward I think that would be really really important and I think that's a you know a learning point for us scientists we really need to take this forward and make sure I mean in my kind of my field we tend to bring social scientists in at the end or it's a bit of an afterthought but I think bringing in that thinking at the outset so we're asking the right questions we're making sure that you know the science we're developing is answering the questions that we need I'm going to lead to the behavior changes that we're looking for. I think that's really key. And I think just to give a quick flavor and a specific example, I think one of the really interesting um, points for, for me from the lockdown has been how people's enjoyment and access to the natural world and nature has been absolutely critical to their health and well-being. And we've seen a huge surge in interest and 70% of people have said that access to nature and the environment has been critical for their mental health and well-being you know, and, and to learn how to address that, we can't address that through one sector. It has to be 
be a multidisciplinary approach and it really could be an excellent intervention because it would you know address so many of society's inequalities and so many societies problems but I think that's just an example of quite a sort of acute problem that really does require a multidisciplinary approach so so that for me is is one of the biggest things I think we should take from this and, and build into our working going forward. Thank you I mean I absolutely agree I think we have discovered in what we've lost what is valuable to us as human beings and I think the two big things are connections that social isolation and loneliness in fact there's evidence that shows that it has a more pernicious effect on health and even mortality than smoking than drinking than bad diet and we hear endlessly about those but we create an ever more lonely uh, society in which people are more and more atomized and you know communities are turned into customers and so on so I think that's one huge thing we've learned and as you say the importance of nature and being in nature I mean there is as you will know more than I do a psychological literature on the importance of of that hopefully now it will be recognized and when we hear about so social prescribing let's prescribe being with other people and let's prescribe being in nature it's a pretty good start so uh, oh, sorry about this this was bound to happen I will turn it off if I if I'm competent enough to operate my phone good sorry about that okay well we've seen a lot of questions now on the in the question and answer section. I'm not sure I'll be able to get through all of them, but I'm going to start with the first one that came in, which is about the relationship between behavioral science and other sciences. One of the issues, I think, is that in many ways we all behave, so we all think we're experts on human behavior. The same isn't true when it comes to vaccinology or modeling or so on, where we all know that we couldn't do it to save our lives. And one of the, I think, the most significant phenomena early on in the, in, in the pandemic was the use of behavioral science by non-behavioral scientists to make decisions which were very consequential. So the notion of behavioral fatigue for instance, which didn't come from the behavioral scientists. It actually came from, 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 from medical people who, who took it as a common sense, led to a delay in the first lockdown with all the consequences we know about. And so the question is, uh, do the panelists think that the role and the position of behavioral science in relation to other sciences has changed and needs to change through the pandemic, a, a question that's very dear to my heart. I wonder if, I mean, Linda, would you like to start on that one? Sure, I'll start. So this is something that I've been aware of actually throughout my career as a behavioral scientist, social scientist, working in biomedical sciences. Uh, so sitting on panels, et cetera, you continually see people who are clinically or scientifically qualified finding it quite easy to either critique or comment on social science topics, subjects, because it's more accessible. It's something you read in the newspaper. It's not as technical. So we're, we're dealing with that all the time. And as Steve said, this has happened in this pandemic and it continues to happen. And there's still a lot of criticism, I think, of the role of social scientists and behavioral scientists, not necessarily from politicians, but from the public who, who think, you know, a scientist means a certain thing. I do think, though, that there is now better understanding probably of that. And I think people do understand now that the, the pandemic has been in many respects about human behavior. And the state's intervention has been about fundamentally asking the public to change their behavior. So I'm optimistic. Oops, sorry, there we go. Not just me. <laughs> I'm optimistic, but I'm also pessimistic because it's a long-standing issue. But it's a great question. I'll pass it on to someone else. Thank you. Mm. Does anybody else want to come back on that question? Not necessarily for everyone to answer every question. We've got a lot of questions to get through. We're going to get them through them all, but I certainly want to give an opportunity if anybody wants to say anything. In which case, let me go on to another question, which I think is absolutely central to the, to the pandemic at every level. It's a question which starts from the premise that this is a pandemic of inequalities, that the way it impacts people is very different, that the more deprived uh, communities and more disadvantaged communities have lost out in every single way. They've been infected more, hospitalized more, gone to ICUs more, died more, lost their jobs more, suffered from problems of education more, lost out financially more. I mean, every single metric, despite the fact that it's also true 
that when you look at frontline workers, those who've contributed most, they also come on the whole from disadvantaged groups. So, so a pandemic of huge inequalities, but it also has implications when we talk about communication and getting the science over because clearly different communities with different histories, with different relationships to the uh, medical establishment, for instance, will receive information in very different ways. So if we talk about communication, is there a one size fits all? Do we need to think about communicating the science in different ways to different communities? And how should we go about it? Does anybody want to start on that issue? Let me start then. Yes, I, I think we have to. I think we have to work out exactly how we want to target different communities. Not, not because we, we think that some communities are, are more lax, but because they're more difficult to reach. And that's been what, one of the, the major problems throughout this. And I, I have not entirely seriously said that so far, Touchwood, I've not managed to contract COVID because I live in a, a semi-secure, uh, semi-biosecure bubble, which is the white middle class. And we, we know that, once again, poverty is, is a public health issue. This is not exactly news. It's just not news that, which is terribly fashionable. And that's been one of the, the, the problems about it. And, and, it's, and, and similarly, reaching certain ethnic minorities has, has been a, a big problem. Uh, I don't think there's a cultural scepticism about science. There is just, a, as there, there has been more generally among other people, a failure to realise that actually science matters. Science is, it was the two cultures thing you mentioned earlier, Steve, that it's, it's a question of, well, there's science, but that happens in that box over there and it's not important. But I do think that people are paying attention now. And I think it's, it's, it's a, very, a very good way of, of doing it. And I know that it, it seems obvious uh, from the numbers that uh, the penetration into Certain ethnic minority groups who were underrepresented in terms of vaccination, who were overrepresented in terms of infections, has actually improved because finally governments realised that they had to do more. They had to make a greater effort to reach certain people. Could I add in on that a bit? Or? Uh, of course, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, one of the, again, agreeing with all of those points, one of the key things I think is that. It's very easy to communicate with the people who want to be communicated to with you, and they give you feedback. So you get responses from them, and it's very easy to get the illusion that you're communicating well because you're communicating with those people who, who you, you do it well with. And, and that can expand, but you'll never, if you continue to do that, reach those individuals who aren't responding. You know, so and that's where you know behavioral science is one where we all have opinions. Communication is one where we all have opinions because we have to do it all the time. And again, we really do need to engage with, with other individuals who can help us become better at doing those things. They're all tied in together. And you know, we, we don't want to be, you know, to use uh, one of the uh, common current terms, we don't want to be responding to our echo chambers. We want to engage with everyone. Mm. Steve, can I just add a very final comment on that? I think. Um, the other bit of the equation for me is not just the communication of the science, you know, in a broadcast, same, you know, one size fits all. It's the policy responses that we're expecting or, or we're asking people to take because people don't have the same choices and the same opportunities. So I think we have to be a bit more nuanced about the kind of response that we think is a is appropriate for different audiences because mm. if people aren't able to take some of the actions then you know we're setting people up to fail and then then there's a you know there's a risk that society judges people for not complying when mm. actually you know we know because of some of the the you know the isolation and the responses that for some people that was an economic imperative they couldn't not go to work and you know we do need to understand that those choices are not equal mm. i just i just add one point um, i remember when I, I i first moved to scotland in 1981, been here for quite a while, and I remember talking to my, my friends down south who would tell me that Scotland was a long way away, and I would point out to them that no, Scotland wasn't a long way away, they were a long way away from Scotland, and I think th there's a similar issue when we, when we use terms like hard to reach, I mean people aren't hard to reach, we're bad at reaching them, because we're dominated and academia is dominated by particular demographics. And so it does make the point 
that to be good scientists who can communicate well with people, diversity is absolutely critical in opening up our institutions and making sure that our institutions look like the people we want to talk to is very important indeed. I mean, people make that point about the police, they make that point about juries, but I don't think we should forget about it when we're talking about academia as well. That's my little homily on the point. Lots and lots of really good questions and, and, and challenging questions. So, so one, well, there have been a number about the notion of uncertainties and the different levels of uncertainties and communicating those well. So for instance, one is about the quality of data and the assumptions inherent in data. We only need to look back to the controversies there have been about numbers of deaths as to whether you use you know, people who've had a positive COVID test or whether people have got COVID on the death certificate and, and making the point that this is not a matter of right or wrong, but communicating the assumptions which are central in our science. So how can we communicate better about the nature of data and the uncertainties in data, uh, in data and the assumptions that there are in data so we don't get into these binary debates of you're lying, you're right, you're wrong. So any, any thoughts from the panel about how we communicate better about the very nature of, the, of data and the assumptions embedded in data? Shall I make a start? And I, I think Roland will definitely have something to say on this, but other mm -hmm. colleagues as well, and Eileen and others. So I think the first thing probably, Ken's already made this point about preprints. So if we just focus on the pandemic and data, it is about being honest about what stage that data is at. Is it preliminary or not? I think it's very important for scientists to do that. The other thing is to say something about design, about if it is a study, what, what kind of study is it? And I think one of the things that we've learned in this pandemic is the gold standard of evidence-based medicine, the randomized control trial, mm. most of the evidence we're using in this pandemic is not from that, those types of studies. So actually there's uncertainty at every stage. And, and even when we could have used randomized control trials to look at things like face coverings, et cetera, we haven't been able to either because of ethical concerns or it's not been a priority for funding, or just frankly, we have not had enough time. So I, I do think it's just about trying in an accessible way to be clear what stage is the data at what kind of study is this as you point out steve it's if it's routine data what do we know and not know about it and and the challenge for people doing science communication is how do you do that briefly and it's not easy hmm. roland yeah i mean i think one of the things that's really important is to remember that we should not underestimate the public the ability for the public to absorb and understand ideas if they're presented in a way that makes sense, I think is pretty high. And, and just to give a sort of anecdotal point about this, when I first moved here from abroad, so I grew up in Canada, when the weather forecast is presented, it, it's always been presented as the probability of rain. And I was really struck when I came over here that it was presented as it's going to be this. And I hadn't realized until I came here that there was this ongoing debate as how much information should you give the public? Is it too confusing to say the probability of rain is 20%? And then, now we're completely used to this, okay? And it's a lot of it is the debate should never have been there in the first place because the, the public can handle these things. So a lot of it is about make things sensible in a way that makes sense to people. Um, and, and I think one of the roles of scientists as communicators, again, both to policy and the public, is to get the kernel of the simple idea that often lies behind what is a, a very complicated scientific procedure. Okay, If you can communicate the idea and the reasons behind things, what you're doing is you're giving the people the opportunity to make their own judgments. And the more we can do that, the more we can communicate ideas and principles in a simple way, I think the better off we will be. It's always going to be hard. And I think one of the issues is that we tend to view peer review as this sort of gold standard at which the evidence is fixed. In many ways, it's actually the beginning of the debate about what science is. Okay, just because a paper is peer reviewed does not mean it's true. It means it's a sufficient standard so that others can evaluate it as being reliable and robust. And I think that's another thing that scientists really have to get used to, um, is that they're opening up the debate, they're, they're not closing it, or they shouldn't be most of the time. 
Anybody else want to come in? Uh, just a, a few thoughts. I mean, I, I totally agree. I think some really good points there. I, I, I think it is about honesty and, and, and openness. You know, we know what we know, but we don't know, you know, and being clear about that and not pretending. And I think it's, it's really important that as far as possible, there's a sort of consistent message coming from the people in the know. I think that sort of generates trust and confidence. And I think one of the things that's going to be really interesting, you know, science is now on the front foot and scientists have you know gained a respect a sort of credibility that we haven't had in the past and we need to, to well to go back to linda's point we need to retain that humility to not overstep the mark and not to abuse that position so that you know we don't take away from this that science is right or science is better or science knows all so i think we need to constantly challenge ourselves not to sort of step beyond what you know the level of evidence and knowledge that we have is telling us so just a, a point of the future, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a very interesting convergence of different points that have been made. You know, so I think one of the issues about science communication are the assumptions that are often made about human psychology and the human inability to deal with uncertainty and complexity. In fact, that's a paper that Linda and I have just written, making uh, the point that right at the core of, of the pandemic response has been the notion that the public, especially during a crisis, can't cope with, with problematic information. And that often leads to a rather paternalistic uh, notion that you've got to protect people from things, you've got to simplify things, you've got to avoid bad news. And the danger of that, of course, is that if you don't communicate that uncertainty, if you say something is bound to happen or is bound not to happen, then one instance of it happening means that you lose trust completely. And in fact, I think there is more and more psychological evidence showing that as long as you are open and you communicate the bases of uncertainty, then actually increases trust and it increases the extent to which people will, will go along with the information you're giving. And in fact, one of the key lessons, I think, of the pandemic as a whole is, is transparency is critical. And because transparency is critical to trust, we've seen that today with the, with the release of a report by Transparency International about um, UK government contracts around COVID, but it's equally true uh, for science as well. And I think if there's one slogan that for me, I think we need to bring out of the pandemic, it is indeed trust the people. The assumption that people need certainty, can't cope with uncertainty, I think is, is profoundly wrong. But let me ask, I want to continue this with, with you for a bit, Eileen, if I may, because one of the things that's always struck me, and in particular about, say, nature programming in, 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 in the UK, which at one level is phenomenal and um, the images are wonderful, but they often have an authorial voice whispering, we know this and we know that. And however brilliant that is, I think it does profoundly misrepresent science because science isn't about what we know, it's about the process through which we get evidence and draw conclusions from that evidence. And that's always open to interpretation and to debate. So I wonder what the implications of what we're discussing might be for such things as popular science programming and popular nature programming. Could we do it differently? And could we do it better to create a wider understanding of these issues of, of data, interpretation and uncertainty? That's a really interesting question. And, and I think the short answer is that we have to get better at that. I mean, what we're very good at is, is describing the status quo or even describing what was in the past. You know, what does our nature look like? What does it look like before? But in the reality, it's changing and changing faster than ever before. We know um, the climate emergency, the biodiversity emergency, things are changing dramatically. And what we don't know is how things are going to look in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So there's a real challenge for us as communicators to uh, and there's been some questions on this in the chat, which is interesting. You know, as a result of the pandemic, people have changed their behaviours really quite radically and accepted changes and constraints to their behaviour that perhaps we wouldn't have anticipated. Now, we need to translate some of that behaviour change into long term sustained change because it's going to be necessary for, for climate change. You know, we know that, but we haven't been able to instill that sense of urgency and immediateness and, and you know, personal responsibility that we need to going forward. So I think there's a big challenge for us to sort of move away from some of the, 
you know, David Attenborough, who's been fantastic about raising the profile of nature, but it tends to be very kind of, you know, photogenic images of beautiful animals. It doesn't tell us about all those changes, you know, all those dramatic losses of species, lots of which, you know, people don't even notice. So there's something about communicating the uncertainty and the unknown changes and how we respond to that and take action now to avoid something being much worse in the future. So I, I don't, I'm not sure if that's really answered your question, Steve, but I think there is something from the way that people have responded to this emergency that we need to try and learn from and, and bring into our, you know, communication around nature and the environment. Yes. So one message is don't be an ugly animal, be a, be a cuddly animal. One question which is, I think, rather imminent in a lot of the, the, the points that are being made in, in, in the Q&A is when we talk about following science, and this goes back to points that people made right at the beginning, have some sciences had more impact than others, leading to a distortion in the way in which we weigh different harms of the pandemic and therefore the policies that we come to? Sure, shall I start again? I'll be brief. Yep. Um, I think so. I mean, there's loads of questions. We're not going to get through all of them. They're excellent questions. I think somebody's asked a question also about why is the media using certain people and not others? So maybe I answer both together and I'd be interested in Ken and others' views. Um, I, I, I actually think that there has been, there's been a very strong emphasis on what the modelers have, have come up with throughout this pandemic, I think particularly early on, but throughout. And so you, I think they have had perhaps more of an influence than, than would always have been the case, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I, I do think that that is true. But I think there have been, as I said at the beginning, all disciplines have made a huge contribution. If you think about the multiple advisory groups, Steve, of course, sits on both the Scottish government's chief medical officers group and also SAGE in terms of SPI-B, their behavioral group, and, it, and independent SAGE. There's lots of different people who've contributed and there's many, many disciplines represented. But on the question that was in the chat about why do the media use certain disciplines and not others, I actually think that journalists have tried to find as many different experts as they can. But one of the things about science communication, and Eileen may have a view on this as well, is that some people are slightly better adapted to doing it than others. Either they prefer to do it, or just in the way they communicate, they get an opportunity to do it. And that might be why you see some of the same people but I think that virologists like the Naked Scientist, my colleague Chris Smith, who's probably one of the most prominent, he's, he's been there. It's not that they've always uh, chosen the modelers or the public health experts. Hope that's helpful. Okay. Can, can I add in on that one a little bit? Um, of course, Chris. I, I do think Lynn is right that modeling has an unusually high presence. I think there's a few reasons for that. And here I'm speaking from somebody who sort of sits within the tribe. I think one reason is because early on when there's an enormous amount of uncertainty, the, the role that models have of projecting possible scenarios is one, one of the very few tools that we have to sort of try to explore looking forward in a particular kind of way, okay? A kind of exploring of how do the numbers of cases of infections today, what do they mean for tomorrow and the next day and the next day? I think that's one, and the other one I think relates back to the point I made earlier about data. We're increasingly aware of data and what data can do. We're not always sure what to do with it. Models are things that do something with it and present often attractive outputs. And what we need to avoid, and I think this is one of the things that most of the people who work are quite principled about this. Now keep in mind that we are trying to do this well as we can and, and we definitely could do better it's easy to be seduced by pretty pictures that use data in exciting kinds of ways. We need to balance off the need to be attractive in that sense with, again, the, the point about being truthful. And I think another important thing to say about this is that there's a lot of things in the chat of, do, do people consider these other elements? Okay, do we consider all the impacts? In a sense, yes, we do. Okay, though don't necessarily fall within a particular, say, modeling question there is a tendency to emphasize the things that we can do in a solid way. One of the key things, one of the key outcomes, which has always been of concern, is the number of people in hospitals and everything around cases. And it's obviously critical because if we overwhelm the hospitals, the knock-on effects are, are catastrophic. Yeah. So, so there's, there's sort of an absolute limit beyond which we do not want to go, which is where the hospitals are too full. 
how close you are to reaching that is another matter. But because models and other things like it can help us address those questions, again, there's an emphasis for those reasons. It's much harder to deal with those other ones. We are aware of them, but they're harder to deal with. So the emphasis can again get skewed. I was being slightly flippant when I talked about pretty animals, but actually, I mean, there is a theme here. I mean, pretty pretty animals and pretty pictures. There's there's a whole theoretical tradition in psychology called social representations theory, which asks how uh, new scientific understanding becomes translated into lay understanding. And one of the concepts they use, well, two of the concepts they use, one is what they call anchoring. So basing new understandings in old understandings, thinking that COVID is like flu, which of course is one of the problems in the early response. And the other is concretization, taking something abstract and turning it into, a, in, it into an image, into a metaphor, into something very concrete and something that you can concretize in a pretty graph or concretize with a, with a picture of a suffering animal. I remember years ago, I did research around the Iraqi, the first Iraqi war, and actually people were more struck by pictures of cormorants in oil than of children. I mean, that is quite, quite striking, but the role of, of, of imagery, I think is really important and the ability to anchor and concretize, I think is really important, but it also might lead to distortions because some things are more concrete than others. But I suppose I want to I want to push on this question a bit because various people have made crit criticisms. So, for instance, early on, it was argued that Sage didn't have enough public health expertise, and that the types of decisions were that were made were affected by uh, the type of people involved in the groups. Or again, mental health, and mental health is one of those areas that we always talk about. I mean, I think in my lifetime, about once a month, a politician will say, we've got to move mental health up the agenda, and then nothing happens until the next month when they say it again. And when we talk about harms, clearly mental health. I mean, there's going to be the Adrian James, the president of the Royal College uh, of Psychiatrists, argued that there can be over 10 million uh, cases of people with severe mental health problems. Have we involved enough of those people? Has it been prominent enough in the debate? Has it led to a proper balance of policy? Are there other areas that are critical that we haven't involved enough? Does, does anybody have any comments or thoughts or want to continue with, with that? Or should we just leave it as a question? We'll leave it as a question because we only have five minutes left. I want to take one particular question, which is, I think, really critical, and then use it to move into a general uh, question for people to finish with. And it's what are the implications for our understanding of climate change? Because as we all know, COP26 is going to be in Glasgow later this year, either virtually uh, or physically. The issue of climate change is now predominating over COVID in, in the headlines. Have we learned things from the relationship between science, policy and public understanding in this pandemic, which we need to apply to, our, to, to how we deal with the issue of climate change? And obviously, I'll start with Eileen on that one. Okay, well, that's quite a big question. So I'll, I'll <laughs> maybe just touch on, on, on a few things. And I think <clears throat> when I talk about climate change, I see climate change and the nature emergency as, as interlinked and intertwined. You, you really can't disentangle entangle them. So I think our and our response to climate change absolutely has to have the health of our planet, you know, at its heart. So I think some of the things that that have become apparent in in COVID in this sort of scenario, which I think have come to the fore, has been that kind of connection between human health environment health and the health of animals and, and the kind of one health response that really does need to be at the heart of us addressing society's challenges going forward. I mean, we know that as human populations have expanded, we now impinge on the natural world in a way that we never did before, which is inevitably causing more diseases to cross from animals to, you know, to humans. That's happened now, COVID, you know, it's happened in the past, it will happen in future. So I think that's been a really important in sort of, you know, I suppose game changer in a sense that we, we can't disentangle these things. And so I think going into Glasgow, going into COP, that understanding of the intimate links between the environment, climate change, you know, and people's health would be really an important kind of thing to sort of take forward. I think probably the, one of the other, some of the other things that we've learned as well is some of the, 
sort of ways we've responded to COVID have been about changing how we do things. You know, the fact that we are now working virtually and we have seen massive changes in carbon emissions because of the ways we've had to work in response to COVID. And we've managed, you know, to some extent to adapt. It has led to isolation and, you know, and a range of sort of, you know, unintended consequences. But there are things about how society has transformed itself and the rapidness and the, you know, the urgency with which we've done things which we could take forward and should take forward as we, we go into climate change. So I think it's about building back better. You know, it's about having a green recovery and a green response. I think if there's one thing we learn from this is please not let's go back to all of those things that we did before in the way we did them before, because we'll have just missed such an opportunity. 10, so seconds, me... 10 seconds, Steve, just something very quick. Um, yep. One of the things we've learned is that humans respond to immediate threats. This is a behavior change point, and that's why a pandemic is an immediate threat. It's not cancer, the other area I work in, and it's not long-term climate change. So we have to harness the short term for for the longer term. Thanks. Absolutely. The relationship. So, one, one, one of the things. Sorry, Ron. No, please. Sorry. No, it just one of the things that that has been quite positive of the way the BBC has covered this and and the media in general is that the really did accept the science or, or certainly the, the primacy of science in this in a way that even as recently as, as well less than 10 years ago the BBC treated climate change as if it was some kind of political debate and you had to be um, you had to be impartial about it you had to say well is it happening or isn't it here's somebody representing 97 percent of peer-reviewed science and uh, let's give equal air time to somebody who won't reveal their funding and who simply denies it's happening. Uh, luckily, that had uh, died a death by the time COVID came along, because uh, it, it did some days though seem as if it was uh, there was still an argument going on be between the virus on the one hand and business people wanting to sell other people drink. Um, that uh, there seemed to be an awful lot of broadcasts about people complaining about the states of their businesses. You know, it's a shame, but this is a major public health crisis that affects the whole globe. Uh, these are not equivalent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Roland, do you want do you want a, a moment to? Just to say that the relationship between the, the time scale of the science and the time scale of the event is completely inverted, which makes the climate change a much harder problem to communicate. And it just echoes what Linda was saying. Mm. COVID is fast, so we're responding quickly, faster than the science actually can be done in many cases. Right. So thanks, Ken, for opening up a whole new set of controversies, which we haven't had time to address here at all, which is not just the issue of how we deal with uncertainty, but how we deal with the issue of controversy. And that clearly was a huge issue, but perhaps more a few months ago when there were all the debates around the Great Barrington Declaration and so on. How do we allow minority voices in without undermining an understanding of consensus? But it's always good to finish not in silence, but with more to talk about. And who knows, perhaps we can have more of these. I found it exhilarating. I found the questions really challenging. So thank you very much for the questions. I don't know if we've answered them. I think we've at least managed to address them to some extent. And thanks in particular to a wonderful panel for your contributions. So I hope people found it worthwhile. I hope people learned from it and hopefully see you again at some other event of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Thanks above all to Hannah Bentley for organising this and the Royal Society for hosting it. Okay, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.